Nobody knows the system better than me, which is why I alone can fix it. To a lot of people, Trump's acceptance speech sounded like straight-up authoritarianism. And as a matter of fact, social science has found a link between Trump supporters and authoritarian beliefs. Being told what to do, it's being, it's, it's, it's that old authoritarian thing. Human nature and bad authoritarian impulses are not relegated to one side. We would be doing the same thing, I think. And I would say, listen, first of all, the ideology of the Democratic Party now, its economic ideology, is essentially indistinguishable from fascism. I would say there's definitely a place in political theory, political science, and history for understanding the roots of fascism so that we can understand if we are having a fascistic moment and what anti-fascism is. And one thing that I see quite a bit right now is a conflation of anti-fa or anti-fascist and anarchists. Anarchism is a formal, deeply long-rooted political thought, but what it basically comes down to is the abolition of all unjustified hierarchy. So that's the general sentiment of any present or historical movement which could accurately be described as leftist, liberal, or egalitarian. Hierarchy or authority, bad. Equality or freedom, good. Before I continue, I'd like to quickly define my terms. When I say leftist, I'm broadly referring to the various forms of self-described anti-authoritarian or anti-fascist types. Progressives, socialists, communists, and left anarchists. When I say liberal, I am broadly referring to true believers of the accepted mainstream political paradigm and the associated political philosophies, such as democracy, social liberalism, contemporary libertarianism, and mainstream neoconservatism. Despite the differences in these two broad categories, they both ultimately stem from Enlightenment values and thought, and so the main element they share in common is a claim to equality, egalitarianism, liberty, or anti-authoritarianism, depending who you ask. And when I say authoritarian, I am referring to its use by by both of these camps as a snarl word, a condemnation of people, policies, and ideas that they claim opposition to. When pressed on what exactly is meant by authoritarian, these types will usually point you to the dictionary. Merriam-Webster defines authoritarian as 1. of, relating to, or favoring blind submission to authority, or 2. of, relating to, or favoring a concentration of power in a leader or an elite not constitutionally responsible to the people. And Dictionary.com defines authoritarian as 1. Favoring complete obedience or subjection to authority as opposed to individual freedom. 2. Of or relating to a governmental or political system, principle, or practice in which individual freedom is held as completely subordinate to the power or authority of the state, centered either in one person or a small group that is not constitutionally accountable to the people. And 3. Exercising complete or almost complete control over the will of another or of others. Leftist and liberal objections to hierarchy and authority essentially boil down to it's not fair, and this is certainly true no matter how you slice it. There's one simple reason why I gave up on so called anti authoritarian philosophies like socialism, communism, anarchism, and indeed even liberalism, and why I still support hierarchy and so called authoritarianism. It's not fair, because fair is not how the natural world actually works, and it never will be. We may be regarded as equal under legal considerations, such as the right of due process of law, but in terms of the natural world, no one is or can be said to be equal to anyone else with regard to things like height, strength, speed, intelligence, or skill level, either potential or actual. This recognition of differential ability is part of what led me away from left-wing concepts like worker control. The aim of worker control is to remove class-based hierarchy, but inevitably one person's labor will be a greater net contribution to society than another person's labor. There's a much higher barrier to becoming a mechanical engineer than there is to becoming a photographer, for example. One would not only need the intelligence to understand and apply the relevant information, but also the motivation 
to make that time investment and effort, and so it's predictable that engineering is a higher status profession than photography. It may seem cynical to assume that higher social status and higher income is everyone's sole motivation, but if everyone is equalized, where would the motivation to put in all that effort actually come from? Why would someone bother if they won't be rewarded for their effort and ability? And why should someone who isn't willing or able to make that effort be elevated to the status of someone who is? Leftists will offer up the meme of fully automated luxury communism as an ideal future in which different sorts of labor might be equalized or eliminated entirely. It's true that automation is becoming more and more common, but going from the present to such a universal concept system is a pretty huge leap. Full automation presumes far too much to be applied right now, especially since proponents can't describe what the pathway towards it would even look like. Barring some sort of scientific breakthrough that changes our very understanding of the natural world, we cannot make a machine that never breaks or can tap into unlimited resources. The law of entropy is constantly working against us. So a long list of questions are raised by the will to reject class hierarchy, questions that various types of leftists disagree on even amongst themselves. Let's just imagine for the sake of argument that they're correct on economics. In a capitalist system, you are systemically depriving loads and loads of people from the ability to innovate in the first place exactly. by depriving them of their ability to mm. innovate. But even if they were, there's one serious problem with their historical examples of anti-authoritarian worker-controlled systems, such as the Paris Commune or Revolutionary Catalonia, functioning. Due to their lack of the chain of command needed for a defensive force, they were all ultimately subverted or destroyed by external forces which did possess such a chain of command. For about two months, everything was pretty darn cool. And the bloody week happened. Oh boy. If your system cannot adequately defend itself from outside forces, it is by default an unsustainable system, regardless of the validity of its economic model. One potential solution to this would be for such a system to spread itself globally and neutralize all potential threats by bringing them under its framework. This was the approach Leon Trotsky wanted to take, global and perpetual class revolt, in order to permanently stall the rise of any external force which could pose a threat. But this is obviously unrealistic, and in the absence of such a political feat, there's really only one other solution to maintain the fruit of the workers' revolution. The Soviet Union was able to sustain itself for as long as it did because of its embrace of militaristic enforcement of its policy and defense of its territory. The various historical examples of anti-hierarchical communes and societies roundly failed to do this on even a basic level, and were destroyed by their competitors as a result. The USSR would have suffered a similar fate had it not embraced an authoritative approach. Simply put, the serious conundrum for anti-authoritarian leftists is this. Either neutralize all threats by somehow installing global communism or global anarchism, or embrace the authority and hierarchy they claim to oppose in order to stand a chance against competitors who embrace that authority openly. However, even these vocal anti-authoritarian sorts of leftists aren't always consistent in their claimed principles. I recently came across a flyer produced by a U.S. organization known as the Spartacist League, which bills itself as a Trotskyist revolutionary communist outlet. The pamphlet describes North Korea as a bureaucratically deformed workers' state. So apparently, even some anti-authoritarian workers' revolutionaries are willing to perform Olympian mental gymnastics to justify what they would otherwise decry as authoritarianism. Still others, like the anarchists, will tell you that Stalin was a state capitalist due to the fact that the state owned the means of production in the Soviet Union rather than the workers. But one way or another, all of this leads me to believe that leftists simply aren't being honest about the implications of their stated goals. They either deny that authority and hierarchy are inevitable features of social organization, or they are dishonest about their own willingness to exercise authority, or in some cases, both. But hold on though, liberals. You're not off the hook. After all, the Berlin Wall was called the Anti-Fascist Protection Rampart, Antifascistische Schutzwall, by the East German government, as in the liberal allies who defeated the Nazis were also fascists. The liberal fad of our time is to focus less on the left and right axis of the political spectrum and instead focus on the authoritarian libertarian axis. Anyone whose views fall outside of the mainstream paradigm or too far towards the authoritarian axis is a communist in the vein of Stalin or a fascist in the vein of Mussolini. They're both illiberal authoritarians and can 
can therefore be dismissed on the same basis. This abuse of authoritarianism as a concept spurns some interesting conversations. The next time someone tells you that they oppose an idea or policy because it's, quote, authoritarian, ask them to explain what they mean. They'll probably point you back to the dictionary, so let's return to those definitions from earlier. The definitions referencing complete subordination are, of course, straw man arguments in almost every conceivable exchange of our day. You would be hard pressed to actually find a person who believes authority should always be thoughtlessly obeyed. The definitions regarding concentration of power are more relevant here. The anti authoritarian trope just doesn't reflect the reality of how liberal societies actually function. In the United States, we have an ever expanding catalog of laws and regulations, with tens of thousands of pages of new rules passed every single year. And in the EU, this problem is measurably worse, with a host of restrictions on speech and self defense. Even to the extent that we can choose our leaders in the United States, this too is extremely limited. When you cast a ballot for your senator or congressional representative, you only have the ability to vote for your state or district. The representative democratic model is highly compartmentalized, and so the individual voter, or even an entire district or state of voters, have little power to actually influence the government as a whole. Meaningful sweeping change in representation would require broad agreement across many states or many districts. To quote a relevant passage from Eric von Kunelt Ledin's Liberty or Equality, monarchy compared with democracy. The absolute ruler may be a Nero, but he is sometimes Titus or Marcus Aurelius. The people is often Nero and never Marcus Aurelius. We have to preface this section with the observation that the individual, as individual not as person, is, in the historico-political perspective, practically powerless. We have said before that the democratic principle of one man, one vote, viewed against a background of voting masses numbering several millions, only serves to demonstrate the pitiful helplessness of the inarticulate individual, who functions at the polls as the smallest indivisible arithmetical and not always algebraic unit. He acts in total anonymity, secrecy, and legal irresponsibility. The articulate and original person, on the other hand, has as great or small a chance to exercise his political influence under either form of government. The effective influence of such men as Leibniz and Voltaire, Hobbes, Stahl, or Wagner on monarchs was at least as great as the persuasive influence of other thinkers or writers on the political masses. Yet since the educational standards of monarchic rulers are usually above average, the persuasive efforts of intellectuals, for better or for worse, have greater chances in a royal framework. One would therefore expect in a democratic society to see the thinker depreciated on account of his ineffectuality. Who can doubt that the Swiss nation is far less affected by the writings of Burckhardt, de Renaud, Amiel, or Vinay than was French 18th century aristocracy by the philosophes? And now to the points of comparison. Monarchy is, by its nature, dissociated from party rule. Only in the constitutional, i.e. parliamentary monarchy, are royalist parties imaginable. Yet in a sound organic monarchy, all parties accept the common monarchic denominator, and the opposition is thus his majesty's most loyal opposition. Democracy is by nature party rule. The president or prime minister is a party man. He lacks originally and often permanently general backing. The monarch is the political and social head of the nation. The president of the United States, on the other hand, is decidedly not a social leader, even though his wife figures unofficially as the first lady. The monarch can, unlike a Republican leader, rule not only through the mechanism of the laws, but also through his prestige, an endogyne force. Even a monarch of mediocre talents and natural gifts has the advantage of having received an education for his profession. A democratic leader can only have the hasty technical training of those with a late vocation, and in most cases he's nothing but a dilettante. Yet this harmonizes well with the general tenor of democracy, whose raison d'etre is not truth, efficacy, reason, study, and reflection, but volition, plain and simple. Some apologists of democracy, in order to arrive at an intellectual justification of their theory, propose an enormous increase in general education, which will enable all citizens to judge the important issues of the day. Yet the goals they set can only be reached by small fractions of highly gifted individuals. Caught between the charybdis of intellectual qualifications for the franchise, which are plainly incompatible with very elementary democracy, democratic principles, and the scylla of an orgy of emotional irrationalism, they steer their course towards the noble goal of education and brains for all. What they do not take into consideration is the hard fact of human imperfection, of original sin." Unquote. In short, the idea that democracy gives power to the people is a total sham. If it's representative democracy, then you get a tiny little sliver of power. If it's direct democracy, you get tyranny of the majority. Either way, you're beholden to forces beyond your control and are ruled by people who are largely unaccountable to you. The other 98 senators or 434 congressional representatives have no reason to care what you think, and there's no guarantee that the representatives you can vote for will actually represent you either. And to make matters worse, the majority of the public don't even pay attention to political matters. The popular belief that the general public are in charge is essentially a form of mass-scale psychological gaslighting. You are my employer. I work for you. 
And so my job as your employee is when running for office is to tell you who I am, what I believe, what are my values and principles, and what are the policies I'll work on. And we haven't even touched on political lobbying yet. Corporate, union, and special interest lobbies have virtually all of these representatives on a leash, hitched to the reins of cash flow well beyond the means of the average person. The Congress spends more time and effort on figuring out how to please their donors than they do on pleasing the average voter. And as I discussed in my coverage of Google censorship, the political problems of our time are not just matters of government. They are matters of massive corporate influence. Corporations are ultimately sanctioned by the government through the multitude of licenses that must be granted, and subsidies which are provided for corporate activities. And so the activities of a massive corporation such as Google are tacitly endorsed by the political establishment. The separation of powers is also vastly overstated as a means of limiting the scope of government, as evidenced by things like executive orders. For example, let's examine Executive Order 10995, assigning telecommunications management functions. Signed by John F. Kennedy in 1962, this order effectively grants the Federal Communications Commission the power to take over all methods of electronic communication in the event of a national crisis. Or how about the numerous alphabet agencies, massive federal institutions staffed by unelected bureaucrats who were instead appointed by committees? Perhaps you've heard of Rex 84, short for Readiness Exercise 84. This interagency contingency plan provisioned for the federal government to carry out large-scale detention of U.S. citizens deemed as national security threats if a national state of emergency were to be declared. These are just a few examples out of thousands of executive orders and alphabet agency plans, unilaterally instituted, with no input from the general public, and no political means by which the public could possibly contest or remove them. I'm in charge. Do you feel in charge? In a number of ways, the U.S. as it presently exists more closely resembles the Soviet Union than it resembles the original vision of the historical or classical liberals, but that's a subject for another video. The liberal response to such observations is typically, well, I don't agree with that either, that's authoritarian too, or to imply some sort of overreaction. So, Google was set up 18, 19 years ago, this was, I knew about this before it was declassified, I'm just saying I have good sources, that they wanted to build a giant artificial system, and Google believes that the first artificial intelligence will be a supercomputer based on the neuron activities of the hive mind of humanity with billions of people wired into it with the internet of things and so all of our thoughts go into it and we're actually building a computer that has real neurons in real time that's also psychically connected to us that are organic creatures so that they will have current prediction powers future prediction powers a true crystal ball but the big secret is, once you have a crystal ball and know the future, you can add stimuli beforehand and make decisions that control the future. But this sort of response can only collapse the conversation back in on itself. The systems exercised in the U.S. and in EU member states didn't just arise out of a vacuum. They are the end result of ideas and philosophies which themselves lay claim to righteous anti-authoritarianism, and yet have produced governmental and corporate structures which definitively fall under that same authoritarianism. Ironically, the neoliberals and neoconservatives of our day even claim to spread freedom and democracy by traipsing around the world toppling governments and installing new ones, which then go rogue and become new targets to be toppled. Rinse and repeat. Sound familiar? Oh, my name is Irving Crystal, and my son, his name is Bill. In my youth, I followed Trotsky, and in truth, I follow him still. <laughs> but to call yourself a Bolshevik would fill the world with dread. So please don't call me a commie, call me a neocon instead. <laughs> The point here is, when you get down to it and actually examine the full picture of how our free liberal societies operate, you quickly realize that you don't actually have many freedoms, and the ones you do have are themselves limited by the government and by corporations. The net result of the neoliberal political framework is a society of unaccountable leadership and centralized power, the very mechanisms that Enlightenment values were meant to deconstruct. But under liberal democracy, this comes with the added negative of leadership whose goals and aspirations are fixated on a time frame of only a few years planning for their short-term job security rather than the long-term future of society, and worse yet, a deluded public who falsely believe that they are the ones steering the ship. So I am, again, forced to conclude that modern liberals, much like leftists, are not entirely honest about how they intend to achieve their political goals, or about the true implications of their worldview. So how did we get here? Well, 
People don't just tend towards exercise of and subordination to authority. They seem to literally crave it. You may be familiar with an infamous study known as the Milgram experiment. There were three roles in this experiment, a test subject, a confederate pretending to be a test subject, and an overseer guiding the subject. Subjects were provided with a list of words, along with what they believed to be an electroshock device. The confederate was placed on the opposite side of a partition, where they couldn't be seen by the subject, and the test proctor instructed the subject to dictate the listed words to the confederate, which would then be repeated back. If the confederate made a mistake, the subject would be commanded to shock the confederate, with the voltage increasing for each incorrect response. In reality, there was no shock being administered, but the test subjects obeyed orders to deliver a shock even when the confederate would bang on the wall or plead for them to stop. Excellent. Slow. Walk. Dance. Truck. Music. Answer, please. Wrong. 195 volts. Dance. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Continue, Don't please. Me. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let well, me out. Let me out of here. Let me out. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let me out. Let me out. Yeah, I mean, gee, I don't know. Well, the experiment requires... Well, I mean, I know it does, sir, but I mean, <laughs> you don't know what he's getting in for. He's up to 195 volts. Answer, please. Wrong. 225 volts. The word is noise. In fact, in the first set of experiments, 65% of subjects went so far as to deliver what they believed to be a fatal shock of 450 volts, just because a guy in a lab coat told them to. I mean, he, he wanted to get out, and he just kept going, kept throwing 450 volts. I don't like that. He wouldn't even look at on that gentleman. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said, he got to keep going. I told him it's time we stopped when we got up to... 195, 210 volts. But why didn't you just stop? He wouldn't let me. I wanted to stop. I kept insisting to stop, but he says no. Obviously, this is obedience taken to an extreme which is undesirable and would have antisocial consequences. But it illustrates not only the willingness, but the active desire for humans to please those they view as leaders or authority figures. It suggests that hierarchy and authority are, for better or for worse, simply realities of human psychology and behavior. The historical precedent for authority as the bedrock of human social organization is simply overwhelming. Even in political movements and systems whose goals are to abolish hierarchy altogether, like anarchism, it inevitably reconstitutes constitutes itself, one way or another. Before we had governments and corporations, primitive humans still had a pecking order, with an unwritten recognition of leaders and subordinates. It's deeply ingrained into us by hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, on an instinctual level, and I doubt we can change that with a revolution or two. Although the use of authority can lead to dark places, much of that desire for structure, leadership, and fulfillment of duty has been productive and positive, enabling humans to build stable societies and achieve great things. Authority and discipline were necessary to build the atom bomb, a terrifying weapon, but they were also necessary to build the Roman aqueducts, to build every great society. And so instead of deluding ourselves with platitudes about being anti-authoritarian, we should think about how to responsibly exercise authority and construct hierarchies, and be honest about what it is we want and how we aim to achieve it. Attempting to dismiss policy proposals or ideas on the basis that they're authoritarian comes off as a rejection of responsibility or obligation. To me, it sounds like nothing more than whining in response to the prospect of being held to a standard of behavior. Or maybe it's just insecurity in the knowledge that not everyone is equally capable, not all of us are leadership material. Sure, recognizing differences in ability or the value of authority might force us to have some uncomfortable conversations or hurt someone's feelings, but that's life. 